We'll just wait. There we go. So the entire intent of this was was not so much to uh, to kind of just present a whole bunch of tools, but it was more um, to get give you some suggestions for next year. So so obviously the idea of implementing this now, as Kendall and I were just discussing, is is probably kind of pointless because for our high school kids and and I would assume middle school as well, some of them are just checked out and. And it's just dragging them along, so to bring something new in now. But the idea is to sort of give you some ideas this week about things to look at for next year. So uh, I'm going to jump into it here. I'll present my screen. I, I think I have a few ideas that that maybe you haven't seen before. Um, there we go. And uh, hopefully, hopefully I do. Hopefully I have one or two that you haven't seen. And if you don't, then I apologize, but I think I got a couple. So these were my five tips or these are my five suggestions on why you should. I think that the sooner we can start with this, the better off it is. Um, getting this idea of a, it's a second language, it's going to improve their math skills. It starts to get them to think logically instead of emotionally. Not that we shouldn't have emotions, but the idea to remove those and just think in a logical sort of pathways, algorithmic sort of a way is, is brilliant. Um, it can be applied all over. We have some ideas. I have some ideas in here, but um, we start to talk about resiliency with the students on when their code doesn't work, what do they do? Do they just, you know, pull up and bail out or pull the shoot or if they jump in a little deeper? And then the idea that, you know, we have some collaborative pieces in here as well, I think is, you know, brilliant when we look at how we can work together, but still individually. So um i i found this one and i wish i would have written down where it was from uh based on the idea of computational thinking and i think that this is this is what i was getting to when i was think, saying thinking prob uh um thinking uh, logically sorry i should actually share this with you guys well uh i i don't know if i did but i'm gonna drop this this whole thing into the chat window, just a link here. So you guys can, uh, if you want, if you want to take a look at it, can can go through this. And, and there are some links in here, so you may want to grab it at a later date. But the idea of, you know, what are the steps to getting our kids thinking? I think with your younger guys, some of these are beyond where they need to be. The idea of abstraction and, you know, evaluation, well, maybe not evaluation, but even generalizing and patterning with our younger kids. We have to simplify what our expectations are as opposed to some of our older students where we need to enhance our expectations where I, I think in some cases we let them off the hook and we don't get them to, uh, to you know, decompose into small enough of steps. They find an answer, they get that and they're like, here you go, it works. And then we go to, okay, well, can it work in this situation? And they develop an entirely new answer. So, so I think that there's some potential inside of those ones uh, to do that, but just some ideas to think about as you're planning these. So, okay, cool. So I came up with, and I tried to start with the most basic ones I have here and, and ones that are probably most suited for our younger students with the idea of this uh, CS Unplugged uh, to some of the more advanced ones. And then I jump into some that are full on course offering. So, so CS Unplugged is a totally um, disconnected, computer program. You can run this without computers um, based on, you know, some really simple things that maybe you have lying around the house. They say strings and crayons, um, but you are going to need some printables. You are going to need some stuff. It's also really useful because it's tactile. It's hands on for our younger learners. It's, it's kind of useful. Um, if we jump into it, it does break it down into a number of topics and a number of lessons within those topics. So to get in there and start talking about, you know, for example, binary numbers, we have a number of lessons, six lessons in here, ages five to 10, we can start talking about it. It tells you if this is a prerequisite lesson for something else. And then you can jump into this specific lesson. And in some cases, and I know that this one is, there is a video so you can see this lesson in action. So for somebody who really isn't sure about computer science or teaching some of these things, it's, it's sort of a, a very, you know, step by step. Here's what you're going to do. Here's how you're going to involve it. Here's what we're going to get going. I like the idea of some of these oops printables, um, which we can start to use 
when we start talking about, you know, following directions and following orders, uh, especially with our younger kids, if we say walk to the door, they're going to walk to the door. But when we give that instruction to a computer, computer doesn't necessarily know that, right? So then we start talking about downloading maybe some of these arrows um, and we, we lay out the arrows in different places and we start to code. So it's, it's very specific, very direct, which is going to lead me into the next one here. But I think this is a really simple one, very, very introductory, uh, apply, uh, applicable all over. I would argue that potentially without saying that it is a, uh, it's a computer programming type thing, this is something you could use in one of our colonies as well. So um, again, I don't know so much about applications with regards to CS Unplugged. This is fairly specific to computer science, but potential applications with an, future ones on uh, in other classes. I don't know so much about this one. So number two I had, let's get back, make sure I hit all the points here. You do need internet access to get the materials, but other than that, you're okay. Uh, there are some programming challenges in here. So if you do want to take it a step farther, there are some challenges with regards to Scratch and Python. Uh, so Scratch being super introductory block based Python, we're getting into a little bit, you know, it is, I would say, the text based language, uh, scripting language that people are using right now. So this is one that, that people are uh, people are sort of focused on. So there are some challenges with regards to that, some interesting things. And then this is one that that could be done at home. I mean, none of this stuff is copyright. You can share all of these activities with home and everything like that. So you can ask families to do a little bit more. So. Okay, cool. Number two, I know that we know about Scratch. This is Scratch Junior. Now, Scratch Junior used to be only available on iOS and Android or Amazon uh, tablets, but it is now available. And I'm going to see if I can find it here because I just installed it. Uh, I believe that this was maybe last year, but it is available on uh, Chrome Web Store. It does recommend, so it's just an app, a Chrome app. It does recommend that you're probably better off. You're probably better off using the Android app because it uh, it may be a little janky and a little buggy. But I haven't uh, I haven't had it fail on me yet, and this will be the day that it does. Right, so. Just going to pull it up here. Super basic, super simple. Um, and it is, we'll start a new project. There is no text involved with this one at all. It is all, uh, it, this is super similar to Scratch. Those of you who are familiar with Scratch, same idea. You have your coding platform. In this case, it's down at the bottom. You have your stage where all of the action's going on. The nice thing I like about this, very straightforward. Uh, you you do have to get some understanding of you know how to start. In this case, you always start these codes by clicking on the green flag. So these different buttons down here have different codes. So for example, this guy here is about changing the physical characteristics of a sprite. These are our sprites. These ones are all motion. Obviously, this one's sound. These ones are loops. So when we start getting into loops and pauses and stuff like that, and then this is ending or repeating our code. So when we do this, you know, we get in and we just drag blocks down onto our coding platform here, our coding stage, I guess. And then we can get into what we want our sprite to do. So the nice thing is if we want them to move once or twice, we can either drag down more than one but then we can also start getting our students working with the idea of changing numbers. Oops. And saying instead of dragging down three or four different blocks of code, we're just going to start entering in the values inside of there and getting it from there. Last thing I like about this guy, uh, especially when we start working with the Cartesian plane, is you can actually show the Cartesian plane on there. So we can start talking to the kids. And, and this, I guess, would apply up into our middle school. Um, my my middle guy was just looking at the Cartesian plane the other day, and I was like, ah, you guys are doing this. You ever done it? And he's like, nope. So I was just thinking, you know, this would be a great application because then you start talking about your x-axis and your y-axis, horizontal and vertical. You can't really see uh, and identify the different, uh, the coordinates. 
But as you bring your guy around on here, you can see it highlights that point and we can start talking about seven and seven. That was a horrible example when the numbers are the same, but 11 and three, and we can start identifying those different points. When it does come time to run it, you can see the stuff move, you can do whatever you need to do. So, so very, very simple one. Um, yeah, I, I, I definitely suggest this for our younger ones. The other one that I, I the reason I kind of like this as well, applications to other uh, subject matter, you can start having your subject either you can record text or sorry, record audio for it to say. So when we start talking about storytelling, uh, we can do our storytelling, the students can develop a story and then they have their stage. They, they're essentially directors of a play, right? Uh, we can also add in the ability for them to speak. We'll put it at the very beginning so it doesn't uh, do anything. So we can have the ability for them to speak, boom, and say different lines and move through and react to different characters, right? We can also bring in additional sprites over here so we can have more than just one character and we can go through. Very, very simple, very easy. Yeah, I would say K to three is kind of the focus of that. Um, but I do think that, you know, depending on how you want to do it or depending on how you want to introduce it, you could get your kids kind of ramped up really quickly if they were in a higher level, but it's definitely suited. I mean, it's it's designed for five to seven. And then I said also struggling and non-readers. So if we have some of those struggling readers. Um, again, it's all block-based. You're going to see a lot of the stuff we're doing is block-based here. So there is some, and I popped off of there, but if we scroll onto the Scratch Junior page, there is some teach and learn activities. So there is some opportunities in here for professional development and, and learning how to do it. Um, and also some lesson plans and whatnot. We'll come back to that in just a second. Principal resources, guides on what each of the different keys do. There's some curricula. These are really designed for the stage where they're coming up with their own curriculum at different places. So, so this has some specific curricula that could be implemented into a class and then uh, an overview of the whole process. So yeah, here we go. Here's some of the activities and assessments and stuff like that. So there's some good stuff in here. And then there's some stuff that's that's kind of junk. Also learn at your own pace type idea. So as our kids are getting into here, they can do some of the learning the interface. And these are the uh, guides that I was talking about. So, all right, cool. Boom, boom. All right, so then we get into what I'm assuming is is most of you are looking for, which is which is the next level up. The next level up when we get over that is CS First. CS First is a platform that's designed and maintained by Google. By Google, it allows you to create um, grades. It is all based on Scratch. You can see it coming up here. It's all based on Scratch, so it's still block based coding. You can get in the back end. You can look at uh, some of the code behind the the blocks and stuff like that but it's quite simple when it comes to that. It allows you to create classes or classrooms essentially, assign students to those and then assign activities to those students. So it's almost like a coding, um, coding course in a box type thing. Now you are limited with some of the activities you can do. You can't, I mean, you can't just crack off and go, wide wide open for it but you are limited with some of the activities inside of here and the paces they go at so if we take a look at the resources and i do have i am signed in here we'll make sure so i can show you about the classes if your student signed in it also keeps track of their work which is a nice bit about it because we're all cloud-based a lot of them are working on you know potentially mobile devices or chromebooks when they get back to school it allows them to sign in and sync their devices so, or sync their work so they don't have to start over at ground zero every time. So I just have one class created. I don't have any codes in there, but it's the same idea as Google Classroom where they just add a code and then jump into it. And then from there, I can start to assign different uh, topics to my students. So based on these two activities, one hour, these ones are fairly simple. Hour of code is one to two hours. So they did a bunch of stuff for hour of code. But if we scroll down farther, there's some multi-day activities. So getting into some of the different ideas on storytelling, music and design. And they do try and scope out beyond just the coding idea. It's not just about creating code. It's about you know creating code, 
based on storytelling or whatever. So, so there is some application uh, to other pieces. Um, these are, are quite straightforward, add it to a class. We can view it beforehand. And then once we do that, um, we would print our own materials. Unfortunately, they don't send them up to Canada for us, which is which sucks because they have lesson plan solution sheets and stickers that they will send to anywhere in the States and they ship them out because we're in Canada and I'll, I'll have to check and see. Um, but last time I checked, they, they didn't ship them up here. It was a sorry about your luck type thing. And, uh, and once you get in, you can start to track what your students are doing and track the, oops, those activities as well. Sweetgrass, yeah. <laughs> all of a sudden there's gonna be like 50 schools in Sweetgrass, right? Um, you can jump into all the activities. There's videos, there's little add-ons and extensions you can do. There's pieces for the students to follow through. Um, and then they get badges as they complete different pieces and, uh, you know, I don't know if that's a motivating factor for them, but that's that's CS first. I I like that one. Um, I think it's a I think it's a decent decent thing for a starting point because again, um, you are you're providing it to the students and then giving them an opportunity to to learn more about Scratch so that they can take Scratch and you know import a model of a cell and have a little their little cat character walk around and tell you about the different shapes of this cell or something like that. Um, you can try and apply it to different topics, depending on the topic is, is where it gets interesting, right? Is how do you bring this into social studies might not be that bad because you could have a platform, you could have a back end, and you could see different things, kind of a question answer um, period. But I'm thinking math might be a little tricky. Steve, you use it in your first module because you do that coding class with, uh, with PBB, right? Yeah, yeah, so Steve's, you know, I'll put him on the spot. I'll offer up his services. Steve's a good one to talk to about a lot of this stuff, so. Um, straightforward, again, it kind of taps out around grade nine. So that's their recommendation is 14 years old. So we're not looking at uh, all the way up, depending on how often the students are or how much have they been exposed to it and how often they're doing uh, coding. This might apply a little bit farther or if they haven't, you know, as Steve says, he's doing it with his high school kids. This is course number or module number one. They're getting in and they're probably just banging through this super quick uh, because it is fairly simplistic and they can. Motivated kids are going to do more, but also it might give them an opportunity to learn at their own pace. So when we're looking at the fall, the unknown on whether we're going to be in school or going to be out of school, um, this might give opportunities for these kids to learn at their own pace and create uh, create some content to demonstrate their understanding. So, all right, cool. So those are my three like straight up tools. These are ones that I think anybody could jump into and anybody could grab onto. Potentially there are others, uh, not saying there's not. I didn't bring up some of them like the, uh, I wanna say Code Academy and um, there's another one. It'll come to me, Codecraft. Uh, it'll come to me. Um, some of those, because I know that some of those are paid. All of these are free. All of these are available without without cost. So code.org. Code.org is most uh, famous, I guess, for the Hour of Code. These are the guys that host and put on all the activities for the Hour of Code. But they also have a whole span of coding classes. Just going to zoom in a little bit on this. So from K to 12, they have different courses that potentially could be used with these guys. Inside of here, you can get a drop down. You can get a bit of an understanding on who it's for, and uh, and what you would do, and obviously the learn more button. But it is going to allow you to take this into your high school level if that's what you're looking at. So you can take it beyond um, just that starting point or beyond that grade nine level, and you can get into some of the more detailed specifics on. Um, computer science and whatnot. This one here is 100 to 180 hours. So this would be a full year course uh, with the units AP prep and a post AP unit. Um, it does say no prior knowledge needed. And this is our highest level of one. I would suggest that 
the students might struggle a bit with no prior knowledge, but generally these guys are setting kids up to succeed and not to fail. So I would say that starting there, taking a look at it beforehand, or if you haven't looked into it, this is going to give you a deeper understanding and, and not just CS principles, but, you know, drop down a level and see what's up there. This one, 50 to 150. So definitely a span of the activities and you can pull out materials when you need them from here. So uh, they also have their two express ones. This one's for our younger learners, the pre-reader and then the CS Fundamentals Express is 30 hours and it's supposed to go from grade three to grade 12. So I, I, <laughs> I question the content on that one when you're spanning that um, big of a frame. But I, it does look based on this that it's using some of the Plants vs. Zombies stuff from uh, Hour of Code a few years back. Flappy Birds, when that was around, they had an Hour of Code to be able to code that. Uh, the interesting thing is how do we bring that all together into another, uh, another course, right? Um, these guys also have some professional learning uh, that you can take now. All of these include professional learning, but they are down in the States. And so kind of in some cases, I would argue that we're probably looking at uh, online stuff and making use of their online stuff, unless you're willing, well, at this point, we can't really travel down there, but I don't believe that there's an expense to this. I didn't, I'll, I will honestly say, I didn't look that closely at it uh, aside from travel. Um, but they do have the online stuff that you can pull out. And so it's definitely worth taking a look at that if you're going to, uh, if you're going to dig a little bit deeper into there. So I'm um, just looking if I can see, and it doesn't say that there's a cost here, but so um, code.org, definitely solid stuff from those guys. They've been producing tons of, of bits uh, for years with the hour of code. The other nice thing they have is their project ideas. So when we start digging down into the idea list on, you know, how do I put this into social studies? It might take you a little bit, but you're going to find something in here that, that maybe you can apply to one of your courses. Here we go, Civil War Basics. Not necessarily something that we would want to do, but maybe we could apply it to one of our world wars or something like that. So, yeah, there's definitely some good stuff in here. Uh, boom, 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 fast track, pre-reader, everything, online activities, again, free. So we're trying to get, stick to the activities that are free. The last one that I have, and this, this might be the most in-depth for you. Um, and, and it's, it's, I would say that this one would be great for a course. If you were setting up a course, I would suggest taking a look at the creative computing lab. I, I did download this and it was hanging from my my uh, um, cork board in my office for a long time. Their curriculum, their creative computing curriculum. There's a bunch of really good activities, very straightforward lessons and lesson plans on here on getting the kids going and creative computing. This is a computer science course. These materials in here are gonna lead you from one to the other. You can pull stuff out of here and you can give students ideas from inside of here for different activities, but it is not set up with specific lessons. Uh, you know, I shouldn't say that. It is set up with specific lessons, but it isn't set up, I would say, to be like, okay, this is gonna lead you to, um, you know, doing something for social studies, or this would be great for a topic on water. Uh, it, is, it is set up a little bit deeper than that, so. Um, there's a lot of, I don't know why I just clicked that one. There's a lot of good material inside of here. And a lot of ways that you can get started and, and make use of it. It does recommend what they call a designer's notebook. So you are doing some offline stuff where you're, you know, thinking of ideas and creating stuff. It's not just all teaching computer, computer science, um, but it goes through a bunch of different good ideas and they focus quite a bit on debugging as well. I know in the first reading that I had of their curriculum, it's definitely something I would say looking into. So I'm trying to watch the chat window as well and, and be conscious of the time. So so those are those are the two. If I was looking at running a full on course, 
that I would go to for resources. The last one I have, and this one for anybody that's been involved, might be some additional ideas that you may want to go to. So I'm going to start down in the bottom right-hand corner here. If anybody did any coding in elementary school, uh, and some of you who are younger, I apologize, but back when we in the 80s when we were in elementary school, Logo and Turtles were a big deal. Um, Steve, I know that you know this one. So, um, But Turtle Academy has re-brought out or brought out Logo again. It is a just, you know, give directions to a little turtle and he goes around the screen and you uh, you make patterns and he's got a little pen that you can draw figures and stuff like this. There's probably a hundred different programs that you could do that are better, but if you're a bit nostalgic, take a look at this one, uh, Turtle Academy. Callisto, which, uh, you know, David, uh, what's David's last name? Um, he works with Callisto. He's a teacher from uh, Elk Island Public Schools. Uh, he's been working with them for the past year. He's he's uh, he's their ambassador, and uh, they do high-end coding for PIM, Pacific Institute for Mathematical Sciences, and uh, they work with Cybera uh, to create these Jupyter notebooks, which is kind of doing data analysis at a post-secondary level. And he's bringing a lot of this stuff down to the elementary. So they have a Python based on Python. Like I said, Python is kind of the the trendy and the the popular uh, coding language and scripting language. Um, speaking of trendy is, uh, Swift Playground. This is only runs on, um, iOS and Mac. So Swift Playground is going to, it's, it's Apple's, uh, rendition of how do you, how do you code? And it's using their Swift programming language because it's Apple, you know, it's done nice, you know, it's clean and you know, it just, it kind of works. It definitely, uh, feeds you towards their Kool-Aid trough. And you got to drink a bit of their Kool-Aid to get into it because they're going to sell you that this is the way to go. Um, but it is going to be solid, right? You know that they do have stuff. It runs and it runs well. So I would say that that is something if you have access to Macs or your kids only have access to Macs and you just want them to produce and learn to code or iPads, that's definitely something I would look at. Again, they're probably going to sell you on it. could be a bigger um, spectrum than what it is but they are definitely looking at getting people developing in there. So the introductory level is going to be there, but also the ceiling is gonna be there as well because they want people working deeper within Swift and developing. Now, anything you do with Apple, if you're gonna develop on a farther end, you do have to have a developer's account to publish anything, apps or any of those pieces. So there is an expense with, if you do wanna create an app and then push it out uh, for people to try and use or get your kids to do that. So. Um, I know that we have a few schools out there that are doing the VEX coding. VEX coding used to only be available on Windows machines. It used to run on super simple Windows machines, but it had an install, an EXE file that you had to run uh, to get it in there. They have an online language, so you can use virtual robots. VEX coding is some of the stuff they use on some of these robotic competitions. Um, Masters College runs it. I think Picture Butte is running it. Um, I think that at one point, Kate Andrews had some pieces there, but I don't know if they're still running that or not. Um, but it's it's a way to to introduce your kids and see if there's you know a a appetite for going deeper and investing the money because some of these Vex introductory kits I think run around like a thousand bucks or something like that. Once you get the basics, you just have to add on, and you can continue to reuse these robots. Essentially, the kids build their own robots and then go from there, but. This would get you in on the programming language and it would get you at least a base code on there. So it runs on the Chromebooks, it's all cloud-based. You can throw it in there and, and get using there. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, Microbits. I'm a big fan, I think I have a couple here. I'm a big fan of Microbits. They're small little computers that you code online and then drop the code onto them. And when they power up, they do only that code. Uh, you can put input outputs uh, into them. You can design a whole bunch of different pieces there. Uh, this is a complete computer science um, curriculum using the micro bits. It's from Microsoft for grades eight or sorry, uh, ages eight to 14. So again, still still hanging out in that kind of grade three to grade nine, grade four to grade eight sort of range there. Uh, sorry, it says six to six to eight, my bad ages grade six to eight so 11 to 14 so we're just bumping it a little bit higher um we my the plan i'm a big fan of these guys like i said 
they're cheap. They run around 25 bucks, uh, 20 if you order a, a big enough set and they're reusable. Uh, it would be a great thing to run like a CTF or a CTS class with because essentially we can charge uh, the students to that fee and then they take a micro bit and anything else home at the end of the at the end of the day. So um, I was planning with Lethbridge 51 to do a, uh, a SAPDC uh, day on this where and it was a little expensive, but you went home with a class set of micro bits and a whole bunch of like accessories, uh, a little joist or a little uh, gaming pad and stuff like that and different modules that you could plug in different sensors, temperature sensors, um, humidity. What else? We had a whole bunch. I got to go back and review the, the content, but that you could then develop science applications for. You could have a thermometer outside measuring temperature and it's reeling it back in. These have radios on it so they can talk via Bluetooth. Uh, they're pretty cool. But so there's an, a complete one in there that you can download, a complete course in there that you can download as well. So I know that there's more out there and uh, I'm going to stick around after. If you like have some you want to suggest, we can throw those up onto the list and, and add to this document. But uh, uh, I hope there was some content there for you guys. I mean, that's it. We're at 3.30, 3.31. I went a minute over. Um, but uh, if you have any questions, I, I know I know enough about these guys to get into trouble, but not enough that I could, uh, you know, I would jump into a class tomorrow and teach it. Unless you're talking about the micro bits, I could probably teach that one uh, a little bit and some of the others. So if you have any questions, absolutely stop. But otherwise, thank you. Thanks, Jason. No worries. Thank you, guys.